Hey Cougs, welcome back to another episode of In The Game. I'm Andre Nava. And I'm Ari Cobb to give you the rundown on the latest in sports. The UFC comes back to Houston once again. UFC 271 had an amazing card with great fights throughout the night. We begin with Roxanne Monaferi and Casey O'Neill. One of the preliminary fights, the ladies took the octagon and went to war. Both landed great shots and Monaferi landed a few takedowns, but it was ultimately O'Neill who took away the win for the night. This was Mona Ferry's last fight, announcing her retirement and leaving her gloves in the center of the octagon to say goodbye. Mona Ferry is a pioneer of women's MMA and she will be remembered as a legend. Next, we have the co-main event, Houston's own Derek Lewis versus Ty Tuivasa. Both fighters exchanged big shots, one right after the other. Ty eventually got Derek Lewis up against the cage and delivers a huge elbow resulting in the KO of Derek Lewis. Derek fought hard and ultimately came up short. But as Houstonians, we still love and support our own from H-Town. And finally, the main event, what everyone has been waiting for, Israel Adesanya versus Robert Whitaker too. In the last fight between Adesanya and Whitaker, Adesanya left with his belt and reign intact. UFC 271 wasn't any different. Both Adesanya and Whitaker put on a beautiful performance. Whitaker landed four takedowns throughout the fight, and Adesanya landed most significant strikes. The fight was a war between two skilled martial artists, but there must be a winner. And still, Adesanya keeps his title and lives to fight another day. With the 2022 World Cup right around the corner, World Cup qualifiers have been intensifying with each round. Heading into the final stage of the tournament with Canada in first place, the U.S. in second, and Mexico in third, the competition is only starting to get more intense for these coca Cap teams. Not in the way you would expect, though. January 30th, we saw Canada face off against the U.S. men's national team with full expectations leaning towards a win for the U.S., considering their last loss against Canada was in October of 2019. Taking into account the disastrous and unexpected loss, we must take into consideration the squad that the U.S. was able to construct. You've got the U.S. playing with the 4-3-3 lineup with heavy offensive factors, a full squad with Pulisic, McKinney, Dest, Adams, who's great on those set pieces. Texas native Ricardo Pepe making an appearance after his exciting debut in the Bundesliga, and so on and so forth. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, when we take a look at Canada's squad, at a first glance, it's easy to label Canada's choice for a 4-3-2-1 formation as bold. And here's why. Considering Canada's missing pieces in their squad and has gaps in their offense due to the absences of Alfonso Davies, their best player, and their best midfielder, Estefan Estacchio, Canada was opportunistic against the U.S., who only created a few goal-scoring opportunities themselves. The U.S. men's national team has a World Cup on the line. Canada has not made an appearance since 1986. In conclusion, Canada beat both the U.S. and Mexico with decent numbers, so there's a lot on the line here for the U.S. And with 64% possession, more shots on goal, and higher passing percentages than Canada, the U.S. has to be consistently opportunistic with this. The international window opens back up for the final matches on March 24th with the U.S. facing Mexico, as they are currently head-to-head -head with 21 points despite goal differentiation, while Canada has their eyes set on maintaining that top spot on the table versus Costa Rica. Champions League is back! We had PSG versus Real Madrid today with a stunning last-minute game winner from Kylian Mbappe, assisted by Neymar, who has been out on injury since November, so it was really great seeing him back on the pitch. And despite Real Madrid's keeper, Courtois, controlling the game with eight saves, PSG had to turn their individual star power on to get them on the scoreboard. Nonetheless, Real Madrid still seemed almost unrecognizable, even with their star players, Vinicius, Benzema, Cruz, and even then, Madrid found themselves struggling to create those intense, fast-paced counterattacks that we're all used to. Same goes for PSG. Both teams were hesitant with the pressure and almost refused to get numbers in the box, resulting in many turnovers and a choppy, unsatisfying match. However, Pep Guardiola's Man City still remains in top form after beating Sporting 5-0 with goals from Bernardo Silva, Phil Foden, Raheem Sterling, and Mares. The trade is on. The NBA trade deal is a go. The deadline closed at 3 p.m. last Thursday, February 8th, and we have some interesting trades happening. The Brooklyn Nets and the Philadelphia 76ers have completed a blockbuster trade centered around former MVP James Harden and former All-Star Ben Simmons. Another trade we have is Torrey Craig returning back to the Suns. This is only some of the trades happening from the NBA trade deal. 
Switching to the American version of football, Super Bowl Sunday delivered for LA fans with a hard fought game from Stafford, being able to open up the game efficiently and finish strong. All in all, the Rams defensive line were the true deciding factor. Donald down the Bengals quarterback multiple times. Robinson, Miller, and Floyd also stayed busy up front, combining to give the Rams those seven total sacks in an offensive game. Not to mention the way Apple became a heavy liability for Cincinnati, making it look like Cup hit his prime while making those runs in the end zone. Joe Burrow, unfortunately, let the nerves get to him, I believe, and hesitation and a slow-paced offense were the brutal factors to the Cincinnati team. Despite Cincinnati's postseason hype, the Rams pushed through in the final minutes of the game and won 23-20 to in regular time. Well, that's all we have for you this week. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Andrea Nava. And I'm Ari Cobb, and this has been In the Game.